last time we started introducing a few concepts of parallel programming, but we um, and we showed some parts of multi-threading without uh, going into too much detail. So uh, we should actually know what multi-threading is. So um, multi-threading basically lets uh, an application or a process uh, run multiple pieces of work at the same time. Uh, so basically each thread is like an isolated bit of work that you can use to um, sort of package up operations that can happen independently. And if your CPU core has, if your CPU has multiple cores, uh, you can map these threads to run on the different cores, or this happens automatically for you. Um, so this type of sort of parallelism is, is very uh, nice because you can be inside your process and you don't have to specify how many threads or uh, processes or how many things you need in parallel before you start running. You can spin up new threads um, sort of on the fly as and when you need them. Uh, and this is a lot faster than having to start up an entire copy of your process. So if any of you have done any parallelism in MATLAB, for example, when you use the P4 loop, that will literally spin up multiple copies of MATLAB to do the calculations for you. Uh, yeah. but that, so we kind of went through an example last time, but uh, shared memory has uh, a few um, more challenges that you need to be aware of. Like if you can have multiple things working on the same task at the same time, with access to the same memory, you have to be careful about um, knowing which or knowing how to access that memory. Uh, and we called these race conditions. And last time we looked at atomics very briefly uh, as a way of mitigating this, but we'll sort of expand on these methods uh, later. So just as a recap, uh, a race condition is when you have two threads or two workers or um, whatever you want to call them, trying to read and write to the same piece of memory at the same time. And uh, these race conditions don't usually cause crashes um, in your program. And the only way you can really detect them is as a, a logical error. So they'll just give you the wrong result. And we saw that last time when we were estimating pi and it was getting severely undercounted uh, because of the race condition. So yeah, the example like last time is when you're uh, when multiple threads are trying to increment a counter at the same time, um, this is a race condition, but pretty much anything where you're mutating the memory in some way will be a race condition if multiple threads are trying to do it at the same time. So if you're trying to append to an array or change the size of an array, it's also a race condition that you've got to be careful of. Like sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not, uh, and your code does have a bug, but it's the worst type of bug because it might not happen every time you run it, only on certain runs. Uh, also, random number generation is also usually causes race conditions, uh, which you have to be quite careful of. Luckily in Julia, behind the scenes, it's all uh, thread safe. So thread safe basically just means it doesn't have a race condition somewhere and, and you're, you're safe to use this function on multiple from multiple threads at the same time. As I said, in Julia, the random number generator has a state for each of your threads, and uh, that basically ensures that you won't uh, uh, you won't have a race condition there. So it's just something to keep in mind if you're going to do this in another language. So uh, I'll skip through this quite quickly because we had a look at it last time. Um, but we had a look at atomics, and the reason it's called atomics is because uh, the operations are designed to be indivisible. So instead of breaking it into small operations, like loading something from memory, uh, adding or adding something to that value, and then storing it back in memory, it will make sure you can't divide it into those substeps, and any operation is sort of packed into one block. Um, and this is just an example of how to do it. So the left it just sums up some numbers in an array that you give it. Um, but the left has a race condition because the at threads macro uh, signifies that you do the inner part of the loop in parallel, and they're each appending to the s variable at the same time. There's your race condition. So the way you can change that is making s an atomic variable and using the atomic uh, 
um, in place app function. So uh, these two codes are equivalent when run with one thread, but uh, the one on the right will be correct. Um, we'll give you the correct answer every time without the race condition. Okay. So there are some advantages to this, and the main one, or the obvious one, is it gives you the right answer, right? It fixes your problem, your bug. Um, and it sort of guarantees your thread safety uh, if you're sort of using it correctly. The main problem, which I alluded to last time, is they're really slow, like orders of magnitude slower than normal sort of addition operations. Um, because if you're ensuring that these uh, operations will happen sequentially or in a block, if you're trying to do, if two threads are trying to do the operation at the same time, only one of them will be able to start. And while one of them is starting, the other one just has to wait until it's finished. And sort of going, uh, this is called putting the thread to sleep uh, and taking it out of that sleep state can be quite expensive as well. So it's not just that they're not processing at the same time, the sort of context switching of going to sleep and then waking up takes a lot of performance um, to, to run that as well. Uh, and this, it gets worse, right? If you have more threads on your computer, these sort of slowdowns get even worse because you have more uh, workers trying to compete for the same resources. Uh, so if you have atomic server, it usually means you probably need to redesign your algorithm. Um, however, they can be used as an, uh, an integral part of a sort of wider solution, but you should try and like minimize your use of these atomic operations like if it only happens like once at the end of a big long calculation, you won't notice uh, the impact. But if you're using them on the inner loop uh, every single time, uh, it can have a huge uh, performance impact. So I'll give an example. So if so, those functions that we just used there is just a sum, and for some array of numbers here, using the inbuilt function, we get around 46 milliseconds. Uh, which is meaningless without comparing it. So if we run uh, our thread saves version with the atomic variable, it takes about 1.1 seconds. And this is using four cores or four threads. So using four threads and the atomic resulted in 25 times slowdown. Uh, so this should give you an idea of don't do it unless you really have to <laughs> in some way. But we can fix the example. Um, so I don't expect you to read all of this code, but instead of um, just looping through the number, uh, looping through each element of your array and adding that atomically, we'll break um, the array into smaller partitions, so smaller chunks, um, and we'll use as many chunks as we have threads, and then perform the sum on the smaller chunk uh, on each of the cores and then atomically add that result. So we'll reduce on each core and then do a second reduce when we're adding to this atomic variable. So before, um, if you had n numbers, you'd be doing n of these atomic operations, but now you're just doing as many atomic operations as you have threads, which is usually 4, 8, 16. So if you have like 10 million items, this is completely negligible. Um, and if we run this, it takes about 14, uh, almost 15 milliseconds, which is about a three times speed up. So it's not perfect, this implementation, like it's uh, perfect would be a four times speed increase, but it's it's pretty close. It's it's not bad. Um, yep. What do the square brackets do on the return actually? Like normally you have like an element, right? Inside. Yeah, of course. So uh, yeah, let me just highlight this. So you're talking about these square brackets when you're accessing this S array. Yeah. So the atomic is like a wrapper around your data. So it sort of guards your data from being used um, improperly. So you can kind of think of that as like the S variable is a pointer to where the data actually is. Um, and the square brackets basically just mean index uh, where that pointer points to, like get me the piece of memory of the pointer itself. And it's just because there's this like layer of indirection involved. Uh, the main reason this works is like if you have a normal array, um, so if you just have like your array with like one element, if you do array 
open and close brackets, that would just go to the first part of memory of here and get that one value out. And what if this was like array equals one, two, would it still just return one? Do. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd have to check whether that actually works, but that's essentially what it means. It's just following a pointer somewhere. Cool. Okay, so you can use um, atomics to sort of guard your, your memory and make sure you don't get race conditions, but there are a few other tools. And again, this is general. This is not just Julia. All languages will have some form of this if it allows you to do sort of concurrent or multi-threaded programming. Um, so a mutex is kind of like a shortening of mutual exclusion. Um, and this is basically uh, a way of locking a resource so that only one worker can have access to it at a time. Uh, and you, yeah, so you can kind of think of this as imagine you have like a room uh, containing your resources and a lock on the door. If a worker comes along and it's unlocked, they can go ahead and use the resource, but as soon as they start using it, they lock the door behind them. And anyone else wanting to use the resources has to wait outside until um, that worker is finished. When they're finished, they unlock the door, leave and leave the door open, and then the next worker can come in to use the resource. Uh, a mutex is kind of like you, you just have one resource. Um, a semaphore is like a uh, sort of extension to a mutex. So it's a sort of generality. Um, so you can imagine having like a pool of resources. So in our room analogy, imagine you have 10 rooms um, all with the same resources, um, or maybe four rooms because it'll be <laughs> easier to think about. Um, so if one worker comes along, all of your resources are available to begin with. You have four rooms. They lock the first door, three more workers come along, they can sort of go ahead straight away, use the resources. But once all the doors are locked, any more workers that come have to wait until at least one of these rooms is unlocked and then they can use the resource afterwards. Um, so yeah, you can kind of like, for example, in Julia, like memory buffers, like allocating memory is quite expensive. Um, and it's, it's pretty bad when you're doing it in multi-threaded cases as well, because as soon as you have to garbage collect your memory to free up space, every thread has to stop what it's doing. Um, so you can have huge performance impacts for allocating memory. So what you can kind of use is have like a pool of memory and each thread asks for like um, access to a part, a, part of, a part of memory that it needs. And then as soon as it's done, it releases that resource and puts it back in the pool. Um, okay, that will make sense. We'll, get, have, we'll go into a few examples. It just ask for like a fixed amount before it tries to do whatever task or can it like keep pulling from the pool? So if the pool is empty, it just has to wait until it gets filled up again. I mean, like say a thread's halfway through a task and it's like, oh, I need more. Does it it's just got to wait. Oh. It just sleeps until there's more resources available. And if you, if you program it so that no resources are going to be put back in the thread, um, then all your threads will just sleep until it's waiting for more resources that are never going to come. That's called a deadlock, right. um, which can happen in your code. If your code just like stops working and like isn't doing anything, it's probably in a deadlock. Um, to answer it. Cool. So in Julia, um, the way you use a mutex, it's not called a mutex, unfortunately. Um, they have this object called a reentrant lock. Um, so mutexes and locks, they're, they're basically the same thing. You, you can think of them as the same thing. Um, but they're an actual variable that you make. So this is like the lock to some resource. You don't tie it to a resource in any way. You kind of have to do that in the way you're using the lock. So um, first of all, you create the lock. By default, it's open and someone can use it. Uh, but you can call this lock function, which um, tries to do, it's called acquiring the mutex. So it's unlocking the door to see whether you're uh, allowed to use this resource or not. So once the first thread comes in and tries to lock this resource, um, it will be able to execute whatever is in this do block. And in Julia, this do block is just like a, an anonymous function that you can write afterwards. Um, there are other syntaxes, but you can just think of it as like uh, lock this and then do whatever code is in this, this chunk that's highlighted in red. 
Uh, when the thread is finished, it will relinquish the lock that it has on the mutex so that another thread can go ahead and, and use it. Uh, and then any threads that find that the mutex is already locked will just wait until the next one is available. And so here we haven't like said that S is atomic at all. We've just used the mutex to sort of uh, guard access to that variable. So you could still have a race condition somewhere else if you don't properly lock it, but this gives you a really sort of fine grained control. Um, I'll go over this quite quickly, but if you want to have a look at it later, all the slides will be online. But um, in Julia, you don't really have something exactly like a semaphore, but you can use uh, a channel to sort of act like a semaphore. So a channel will let you create um, like a pool, like a collection or an array of resources. So in this case, I'm going to create a, a channel containing integer values. And you can give it like a buffer size, say there's four, uh, you can only have four of these items maximum at a time. So that's like your capacity of your channel. Um, and then when, yeah, so this first block will just fill the channel up with the resources. So it's just putting um, four integer values of zero inside. And so in your threaded for loop, um, your thread, requests one item from the pool. So the current count of a value, for example, uh, uses that value. So like S plus equals N uh, and then puts the result back in. So it takes the result out, uses it in some way and then puts it back in the channel. Now this take function, if the pool is empty, it will just wait uh, as we were saying before. Um, and so that will just sleep uh, until um, it has enough resources there. And again, the put function, if you have a capacity of four and you're trying to put something in there and there's already four items there, it will sleep until someone else has taken an item out and there's a free space uh, to put things in there. Um, finally, you just take all the values out to sum them together to have the same functionality as before. Um, but this sort of channel thing is not really used like this. I, I should say the examples on the past few slides don't write your code like this. It's It's not very performant at all, just demonstrating how they could be used. But a channel is really good at uh, implementing what's called a producer-consumer pattern. So you can have one thread producing data and the other thread processing it. So you can think of this as like uh, one thread that will read data from a file and sort of put it into a channel, into a buffer, and the other thread will take the data that you've read from a file and start processing it immediately. So instead of having to read the entire file and then start processing the data, you can do it um, almost instantly as soon as you start. So you can process line by line and then or read line by line and then process at the same time. And channels are very good for, for doing that. OK, so this is I've left this one to last. This is what I recommend you do. Try to avoid mutexes, semaphores, atomics if you can, because they're not very performant. Um, so this idea is basically you just make sure that you don't have race conditions um, by sort of having a copy of your memory for each um, thread that you have uh, accessing it. So this is the same code that I showed last time on Tuesday. The only difference is uh, this line here, before we just had one counter, nc equals zero. Uh, instead, this time, we're just going to create an array um, with the amount of elements equal to the number of, of threads. So if you have four threads, you create an array with four elements inside. And the whole idea here is the way we use it is for each of the threads, we just use the index of the thread or the ID of the thread um, to index into that array. So you know that um, one thread will only use uh, one part of the array. So you have no race conditions because there's no overlap at all. Uh, so this completely works. It's uh, it's fine. There's no uh, bugs in terms of like logical errors. Uh, the only issue is it has really bad performance. But it's hard to actually understand why there's bad performance. So 
I'll explain this graph a bit first before I plot the threaded line on. So this is one way of looking at how your parallel code takes advantages of the resources you have for different like input sizes. So um, in our example of estimating pi by throwing darts on a dartboard, uh, n is like the number of darts you throw. So that's on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're going to look at the relative performance to just like the serial algorithm. So if you do no multi-threading at all. Um, so the orange line that you see is just the sort of baseline performance. Uh, if you were to just run the algorithm in the most basic way on one core. Uh, the blue dashed line at the top is the number of cores on the machine. So you would expect to not exceed this line at all. Uh, if you can get close to this line, that's really good. It means you're making the best use of the resources you have. So if we plot the code that was given on the previous slide here, you can see that when you get to about 10,000 darts, it starts to get a bit better, but not much. And the sort of performance increases start to stagnate um, sort of later on. Uh, the start of this graph is very typical though. You will see this even if you have uh, the most optimal implementation. So this first sort of uh, difference between the serial algorithm and the threaded one for very small values of n, you're sort of seeing the effects of the overhead. So being um, having to separate your workload onto multiple different threads uh, takes some time and it takes some resources to be able to schedule the work amongst all the threads and spin up new threads as well, it takes time. So this is usually like a constant overhead um, that happens at the start. So it usually doesn't grow with your input size, uh, which is good because it means if you grow the input size, this sort of constant factor will start becoming less and less relevant. And that's why you see uh, the threaded closing the gap with the serial implementation. The problem is there's some bottleneck. Some, there's something um, that's stopping uh, the performance from reaching the theoretical maximum. Uh, and that's what we'll talk about next. So uh, the, the problem of uh, the reason why this performance is so bad is mostly to do with what's called false sharing. Um, so false sharing is basically a performance bug and it's to do with actually how CPUs are structured. So it's nothing to do with how your code is written. It's just how the physical hardware is implemented. Um, and this, again, is not common to, to just Julia. This will happen in C++, Fortran, any other language, because it's to do with the actual hardware itself. So if you remember, the CPU has a local storage on board called cache. And it uses that to basically increase uh, performance because getting memory from RAM takes a long time. You have a really high latency. Um, but the way it can do um, operations like on arrays really quickly is instead of just getting one element from an array, it will get an entire contiguous chunk of memory. And this is called a cache line. So if you have um, four elements in an array and you ask for the first one, it will probably put the entire four elements into your cache so that if you need the next element, it's in cache already and you don't need to make that trip to RAM. So as we said before, arrays are also contiguous. They're, there's no spaces between the elements. They're all tightly packed together. Um, and so that means that elements that are right next to each other in the array are probably in the same cache line. And CPUs get data in cache lines, so they'll get an entire chunk. And because each CPU core, which if you have multiple cores, the threads will run on different um, different cores. They have separate L1 caches, and the L1 cache is where this cache line will end up. So if one CPU core modifies this cache line, uh, it signals to the, the CPU, which has some sort of caching algorithm, that that um, cache line has been changed or modified in some ways. So if that cache line is used by another CPU core, uh, that cache is now invalidated. And invalidated basically just means it needs to be reloaded. So the CPU will flush out whatever's in the cache and then put, it, put everything back in memory 
and then draw the cash back in. So you're essentially undoing all of your cash operations if you're causing these cash invalidations. The reason why it's called false sharing is because even if you're not accessing the same elements, they might be in the same cache line. And um, so you're not actually doing anything logically wrong. It just ends in a performance bug. Uh, in the end, just because uh, these caching algorithms work on cache lines and they don't have any knowledge of how uh, the inner part of the memory is actually changed. So it doesn't know that you're only changing like the element on the end um, and you don't need to have a valid copy of the element at the start of the cache line. Yeah. So is, is this only a problem because we're using an array? Like if I stored these separately? Would, would yeah, you you'd avoid the problem. Yeah. So the reason is because we're using an array. So there's an experiment that we can do to sort of test this theory of why it's slowed down. So at the moment, we're just creating an array with four elements for each of our four threads. Um, but what we can do is we can create more um, elements than we actually need. So for example, you could create uh, eight elements and sort of space out your counters by some amount in memory. So here, the spacing is just two. And, and if you can see this in the code, the only modification we made was we just multiplied the number of threads by the spacing. That's just an input parameter. And when we're accessing the data, uh, we just multiply the thread ID by the spacing. So it's a fairly simple mapping. Uh, and again, we can sort of increase the spacing. And if we were to benchmark all of these for different spacing values, we should see some correlation between the spacing of the arrays and the performance. So the graph we see is as you increase the spacing, the time taken to evaluate the function decreases like quite significantly. So if you just put in two spaces between your elements, you get practically double the performance. Uh, and this sort of tapers off as you get past like four, maybe five, uh, four or five spaces, which tells you that your cache line is likely to be around 256 bits. So it'll get a 256 bit chunk from memory. And yeah, so be aware of this. Um, it shouldn't come up too much in your code, I'll be honest with you, but specifically if you're doing this reduction with variables and you think, oh, I'll just create an array because it, it, it's easier that way, it might introduce a lot of performance issues. Um, so only sort of look for this if you uh, if you think you're going to get 16 times performance, but you're actually only seeing two times performance. This could be one of the the reasons for it. Okay, so the question is like, how do we actually fix this? And the sort of easiest approach, which usually works um, for a lot of problems like this, is we just chunk the work between all of the different uh, threads we have. So if we have four threads and we're trying to through 16 darts, we just say to the first thread, you run four copies, second thread, you run another four, um, and so on and so forth. And we do the reductions like locally, like in a local variable. So we don't like create an array to store the results. We just get the thread. We only spin up four threads uh, and that's it. So our loop is only four, um, four iterations long. And we do the uh, reduction locally on each thread or each of the chunks. And then at the end, we do this final reduction of these four items in serial. And this final one will occur in constant time, like relative to your input size, because it's just constant in terms of the number of threads you have. So on the left, there's an implementation for this. So we're still using an atomic here, like the algorithm is basically the same. We're still using an atomic. Um, there should be a zero inside these brackets. That's a slight mistake. Um, but when we're doing our for loop, instead of going from one to n, we're just doing from one to the number of threads we have. And then on each thread, we're like chunking up the work. And I said before, this is kind of like a map reduce. It's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, this is just an inbuilt function in Julia that will do it serially. Um, and then we use the atomic function just to do this uh, final reduction in serial. Uh, and again, 
where we get our estimate by calculating the ratio of the number of darts that have hit to the number of darts we've thrown and, and multiplying by four. I should also mention as well is if you're actually doing this, uh, you don't have to um, you don't have to times two minus one, right? You can just do one quarter of your dartboard and then not multiply by four at the end. Um, yeah, something like that. Uh, it's doing more work than it actually needs to do. But we, I'll bring up both of the graphs. So on the left was the performance graph that we had previously. Sorry that they're different styles, but they're the same data on the graph. So um, we still see this sort of overhead um, impact on very small system sizes. So this is like uh, 100 to 1,000 elements. And because for each inner part of the loop, all you're doing is choosing two random numbers and squaring them, adding them together. That's not a lot of work for a single thread. Um, so this overhead makes a huge difference for these very small values of n. But as you start increasing this to like a million uh, inner values, uh, then you can see it's starting to hit the theoretical maximum performance. Um, if your inner loops, so instead of it taking like nanoseconds for each dart, if it takes microseconds, milliseconds, uh, you usually will see um, it saturate the maximum performance uh, far quicker. So the more work you're allocating per thread, um, the better this will look. The sort of overhead on spawning threads is like, I think it's about on the order of like 10 microseconds. So if your inner loops fast uh, takes more time than that, you probably won't see this overhead. Okay, that I think is everything.